I invite you to open your Bibles to Luke and chapter 9. And I want to begin with, uh, with this. There's a lot of detail in this. For, for eight hours, he prepares his uniform and his mind for duty. Every day of his duty, he gets a fresh haircut. He will not vary from his command a single step for a single second, no matter the weather, no matter the hour of the day, no matter the day of the week, no matter the number of people watching, no matter if no one watches at all. You've seen his picture. Some of you have visited the place where he serves. He is the unflinching guard, the sentinel, a member of the 3rd United States Infantry Regiment of the United States Army, the men, the women who guard the Tomb of the Unknowns in Arlington Cemetery just outside our nation's capital. For every minute of every day since July 2nd, 1937, which is when they began posting a 24-hour guard, the old guard has stood guard, and there is nothing casual about how things are done at Arlington National Cemetery. When a sentinel comes on duty, he walks exactly 21 steps across the tomb, representing a 21-gun salute, highest honor given to military or foreign dignitary. When he turns, he faces the tomb and stands for 21 seconds. Then he walks 21 steps across the tomb and pauses and turns and waits 21 seconds. And he will do this over and over, repeating the process until the shift is completed. When the job is well done, it's nearly impossible to see any, any movement in uh, the soldier's head or weapon. The average age of those who serve the Tomb of the Unknowns is 22. Uh, these young enlisted men and women with ranks ranging only from private first class to specialist, they, they prepare for weeks to take their turn at the tomb. They're assigned to groups I read by their height. Uh, there's never a variation of more than two inches between as they change guard. Now, whatever team is there on a day, there's never more than two inches difference in, in height. Strict training ensures the guard will be unflinching, unwavering in their responsibilities, no matter the heat of summer, no matter the driving rains of December or the freezing snow of February. And most importantly, the guard will remain posted and the steps will remain perfect when there's not another soul in sight. When no one is watching, the sentinel remains diligent at midnight. Now, I want to say something about the members of the 3rd United States Infantry Regiment of the United States Army. If you want to join this group, you're going to have to learn a new way to walk. To walk in the same way as every other human that visits Arlington National Cemetery is to lose the opportunity to walk with the old guard. You miss a single step. When it's your turn to guard the tomb, you miss the opportunity to stand with those who have stood before you. To understand the motivation behind your duty is to, to misunderstand that motivation is to miss the point entirely. For this is the point. Inside the tomb of the unknowns at Arlington Cemetery are men who gave their lives for the freedom we know. And then surrounding the tomb of the unknowns, uh, a quarter of a million others who have given their lives in service to this country and then around that cemetery other national cemeteries and other small country cemeteries hidden away where there are buried the bodies of those who have served our country as reminders that freedom isn't free at all instead it came at, at a fierce in a terrible price. And that sacrifice is worth a 24-hour guard, seven days a week, 12 months out of the year. And you just don't walk the same way when it's your turn to guard the tomb. Now, 
one of the most common ways to describe what it means to be a Christian, a follower of Jesus Christ, to live the Christian life. It's referred to as your walk. And for those of us who name the name of Christ as Savior and Lord, we just can't walk like everybody else walks. It can't just be like everybody else. In this series we've called Follow, we have talked repeatedly about what it means to follow Jesus. And it's not just something that happens by accident. It's not something that takes place on autopilot. It's not a pick-and-choose buffet line of spirituality. It's not casual Christianity. We have said it is a lot different than being a fan of Jesus, to be a follower of Jesus Christ. I've always been drawn to what Peter wrote in 1 Peter 2. He said, for For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He has has modeled what it means to follow. He taught what it means to follow, and and he trained his disciples in what it means to, to really be a follower of the Savior. People claim all sorts of commitment to Christ. There's lots of big, I love Jesus. But the truth is, if you're not following Jesus, you're not a follower of Jesus. Is that math complicated? (laughs) If you're not following Jesus, you're not a follower of Jesus. And that's how the Bible continually declares this. Yes, I'm a follower of Jesus. I just don't follow Jesus. It just cannot work that way. That's why we're talking about a lot of different things about what it means to follow Jesus. And the lines in the Bible are so clear and so measurable. And we like to make it vague and poorly defined, but God does not. There are things that happen when you're a follower. And there are things that get discarded when you're a follower when, when you belong to Jesus, when your sin has been forgiven, when you know you're going to spend eternity in heaven with the Lord. Now, the challenge from the Bible, to put it simply, is we're expected to walk in a different way, to live life, to go through life in a different way than everybody else when, when we follow Jesus. And it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if there are people watching right now. We're in a crowd at church, it doesn't matter if people are watching or if no one's watching at all. Our steps are sure and our commitments are clear and we're going to follow Jesus. It doesn't matter if the walk is pleasant or difficult. It doesn't matter the circumstances, the physical, the emotional, the spiritual strain. Walking as a follower of Jesus requires a different step than the rest of the world. Jesus was once asked by one of his critics, trying to catch him in in something he was teaching, to accuse him of false teaching. What is the most important commandment? And Jesus said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And that's one of those places where Greek words are important. We'll say again, you know what all means? It means all. There's, There's no big secret to it. All means all, just like in English. It's the same thing in Greek. It means all. It means the total commitment of the total person for the total life. You say, okay. And, I, and boy, so I visit this again this morning in my, in my personal time with the Lord. All. How am I doing it all? I go, wow, I stink at all. I got a long way to go to get to all. The question is not, have you arrived? The question is, are you leaning into it? Or have you abandoned it? Or have you never even taken up that, that level of commitment to say, I'm going to try. I'm going to attempt to live this life as it has been defined for me in God's Word. Some people, I think, uh, approach a passage like that, Matthew twenty two thirty seven, and say, Jesus was just blowing some hot air out there. He was, uh, he was looking for a quotable quote, a tweetable tweet. Something that uh, people, oh, that's a, that's a good one. Oh, yeah, but he didn't really mean it. Surely he didn't really mean that. Jesus, my Savior, my Lord, is he really Savior? 
And, and Lord is so defined in Scripture. Is He really Lord? Think about that. How, how casual have we become in our walk with Christ? And how easily distracted are we from a walk with Christ? How, how, how quickly we become sidelined. That, do you think that Jesus died on the cross and told us to follow Him and all these things so that so that we could take it or leave it? So that so we could just say, well, okay, he's, a, he's on my list. That's more than some people. He's on the list of stuff I do. He may not be high on the list, but he's on the list. Isn't that enough? It's, yes, how, are we, how am I doing right now in this whole thing of being called to be committed to Jesus Christ, to be a follower of Christ? Let me give you an example. If, uh, if a young man begins giving a portion of his income to the church. He carves out time to attend and to serve at his church, a part of a fellowship of believers. If this person tells people, here's what Jesus means to me. This is my story of the difference Jesus made in my life. And this same young man, he, he, he's reading books like Aside from just the Bible, he's reading other books that are going to strengthen him and grow him in this commitment. Some people would say, why, he's a fanatic. He's a nut. He's an extremist. But you take this same young man, and he starts saving up money sacrificially to buy an engagement ring for his beloved. And if this same young man carves out time in a busy schedule to regularly be with that young woman he loves so. And he goes on dates and takes her and celebrates her and enjoys being with her at all times. And if this same young man, he writes love letters to her and he, with great joy, reads love letters from her, what do we say about that guy? We say, he is in love. He's just a guy who is in love. Is there, is there evidence in your life that would say, you're really, you really love Jesus? And the, the trajectory of your life is toward expressing that love, living that love, being in love with God. We are going to look at Luke chapter 9, and I want to read beginning in verse 18, and we'll read down through verse 27. Luke records it this way. Now it happened that he, Jesus, was praying alone, and the disciples were with him, and he asked them, who do the crowds say that I am? And they answered, well, John the Baptist, others say Elijah, others uh, that one of the prophets of old has risen. Then he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Peter answered, the Christ of God. And he strictly charged and commanded them to tell this to no one, saying, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. It's amazing. As, you're, um, as I'm going back through my Bible reading, I'm reading through the Gospels, and how many times in the Gospels that sort of phrasing in, uh, in verse 22 shows up that Jesus tells them, going to suffer, mistreated, going to die, going to be raised from the dead. And their response, because it's so unthinkable, they just, they, they always come back to it and say, what in the world does that mean? Exactly what it says. Exactly what it says. Verse 23, and he said to all, if anyone would come after me, if anyone would follow, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses, forfeits himself? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. But I tell you truly, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. We're going to work our way through those last several verses back in uh, verse 23 and on. And uh, there's a few things you want to make note of before we get to the outline portion of things. 
Now, in this line of thought, there's some important things about this thing of discipleship, of following after Jesus. And remember, discipleship is a process. The goal of the process is to become like Jesus, to reflect his character, to reflect decisions that he would make, to live life the way he lived life and would, has called us to live life. And the image of taking up your cross is powerful. Jesus later says in uh, Luke's gospel, whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Well, now that's drawing a line in the sand. Whoever does not take, it's not, well, that take up your cross thing, that's probably good for some people. You know, you can't even be his disciple if you're not willing to do this. So Jesus has made this so plain, so clear, and and the line's so, so uh, vivid. First word we want to look at, if. And uh, that word in verse 23 reminds us, following Jesus is a choice we make. It's not a given. It doesn't just happen. It's a choice we make. And we're making it every day and multiple times throughout the day. It being a follower of Jesus comes as a result of commitment. It doesn't come as a result of good intentions. It doesn't come as a result of, of evolution. Disciples don't evolve through the years. They are made through commitments. If. That's when we call for commitment. We call for commitments in multiple ways, in multiple places. We use commitment cards throughout the course of a year in other ways to, to say, take a next step with God. Because if you haven't taken a next step with God, you're also not growing toward Christ. When was the last time you did something beyond where you have been in relationship to Christ? And that's a big part of discipleship, always finding that next step. If, first word. Second word, deny. And it means deny anything that would compete for your commitment. To turn back, turn away, turn aside from anything that would hinder that commitment. And it's, it's unique to each person. We'll, we'll give some biblical examples of that a little later. It, it may be, for some people, it is an easy life. For some people, it's their ambition, it's their pride, it's their stuff. It's anything that hinders the highest calling of God on your life. Anything that hinders your fullest service in Christ. And there are things you give up so you can gain the greater things. That's the idea. So, deny. The word deny is the same word that, that Peter used. Uh, used of Peter when it says Peter denied Jesus three times. He said, I don't, I don't know him. I don't have anything to do with him. It is to repudiate, renounce, disown. To deny yourself. Jesus, by the way, Jesus was talking about denying yourself some pleasure. Like uh, people say, yes, I am denying myself. I'm, I'm going to give up chocolate for Lent. Oh, my. When, when our Christian faith is reduced to, to that, those sorts of levels, we've denied Christ a whole lot more than we've denied ourselves. We're going to have to refocus this in a big, bold in a biblical way. He's talking about a complete way of life, a denial of your own selfish interest, that this is my agenda, this is what I want, and saying, I'm going to turn aside from that, and I'm going to follow Jesus. And in those three commands in verse 23, deny, take up, follow, the verb tense says it's a continual process. You don't, you don't get that done one day and say, I'm all done with that, and I don't have to worry about it anymore. It's every day revisiting and, and, and recommitting and refocusing our hearts. Now, when, when confronted with a claim like that, okay, deny yourself, we like to, we like to hedge our bets as, as uh, pseudo-followers, I guess. Can I work out some sort of compromise? Can, can I... Just live for Jesus part of the time and live for myself part of the time. And that's how we practice it. We're, okay, this is Jesus' time today. Tomorrow, that's my time. It's not, it's a compromise. And really, Jesus didn't give us that option. He dealt with that objection in verses 24 and 25. If you want to save your life, which means I want to save myself from self-denial. I want to save myself from turning away from 
turning away from my agenda and putting all my focus on God's agenda. And he said, when you want to save your life, you will lose your life. But if you'll lose your life, that deny yourself for the sake of Christ, you find life and you find eternal life. Take up the cross. Sometimes on take up the cross, we weaken that to, well, I have this problem. This is just my cross to bear. Please do not ever say that in my presence. That is not a biblical statement. Don't do that. Deny myself. Take up my cross. This is my cross to bear. And it's this problem. It's this difficulty. It's this illness. It's just the cross that I have to carry. This business reversal. It meant so much more than that when Jesus said it. What we do with the Bible often is we take this, these words and we put them in our context. And the way to interpret the Bible is to say, what did the Bible mean when it was said? What did it mean when it was said? In this context, what did it mean? And that will help us to know what it means for us. It's a key to interpreting the Bible well. The cross today uh, in our culture is a beautiful symbol. It reminds us of all kinds of things. And for me, when I see a cross, a uh, window up here, the cross, a cross on top of this building reminds me what Jesus did, dying on the cross to pay for my sin. And we have cross jewelry and we have crosses that we decorate our homes uh, with. The cross is a special thing to us. But when it was said here, the cross didn't have any of that. When Jesus said, take up your cross to these guys, they didn't think, oh, that's a beautiful thing. I'm going to get a cross and wear it around my neck. I'm going to get a cross and put it in my house. They would never have considered such a thing then. That doesn't mean that you can't today because it does remind us of some special things. But that's not how these guys heard it. They were familiar with what a cross represented, what it meant. Jesus was 10 or 11 years old when... A guy named Judas the Galilean led a revolt against the Roman Empire. He gathered a lot of followers, and it was a significant revolt for the, for the region. So Judas the Galilean, he, he organizes this revolt, and he went to Sepphoris where he had a lot of support. Sepphoris was a growing, large city. He went to Sepphoris, and he raided the Roman armory there, took what they had to arm his, his rebels. Now, here's the thing about Sepphoris. Sepphoris is only about four miles from Nazareth. Jesus grows up in Nazareth. Joseph is located in Nazareth. When, when Joseph, as a carpenter, Nazareth was a sleepy little town. Sepphoris was a growing city. Probably Joseph spent a lot of time in Sepphoris as a carpenter, uh, building the city during its fast growth years which ended with Judas the Galilean. Because what happens is the Romans, they weren't too patient with this. And they went to Sepphoris, and they burned the city to the ground. They took the citizens of Sepphoris, and they sold them into slavery. They gathered up 2,000 of the people who were a part of the rebellion, and they crucified them. 2,000 crosses down both sides of the street. The Romans were serious about deterrent to crime. You do not do this to the Roman Empire. Jesus and all these people, they had seen crucifixion. They saw the brutality of it, the ugliness of it, the violence of it, the blood of it. And it had marked them significantly. And so when Jesus says, take up your cross, it was something serious. The old rugged cross it's a symbol of death. And it stands for the abrupt, violent end of a human being. And in Roman times, the biblical first century, when, when someone took up their cross, they, they were on their way to the place of execution. The Romans loved for people being executed to carry their own cross. We see that in the example of Jesus. Carry their own cross. When someone took up their cross, they didn't say, all right, let's load up the cross. See you guys later. I'll be back this afternoon. There was, none, there was no looking back. There was no 
see you later. You were on your way to execution. You were on your way to die. And there was no, there was no turning back. There was no possibility of appeal. The story was, was ended. The cross made no compromise. It modified nothing. It spared no one. And then take up your cross daily. Verse 23 says, the disciple of Jesus Christ is not made in a day, they are made daily. A follower of Jesus Christ is not made in a day, they are made daily. It happens, it's every day. We revisit our commitments, it's every day. We lean into relationship to God. That's how disciples become. You, you, you don't burst full born into the world. You're a new creation in Christ the moment you give your life to Christ. But to become that fully developing, developed follower of Christ is a decision that comes daily. And the commitment is continual. And most of us, we're really good sprinters. We are good for a moment, good for a day, good for an event. And then uh, we're ready to sit down for a while. We, we, we give up too quickly, too easily. Surrender to Christ and His will and His agenda and His purpose is a full-time commitment. And then verse 24 has the word life. For whoever would save his life will lose it. The, the word there is psyche. It refers to all that makes up the real you. The, your, your, real, genuine, your, your real genuine self. To take up your cross is to, to say I'm, I'm losing what I've defined as my real self in Christ. And I'm going to be defined in how I live life and how I go about life by Christ. Most of the time, we treat ourselves as the most important thing in the world. But if we're to follow Jesus, we, we, we really need to embrace that, that viewpoint that John the Baptist had. John the Baptist, he was, he was drawing crowds. He had a lot of acclaim, a lot of influence. But G, uh, John said this of Jesus, he must become greater, I must become less. It's got to be more about him and less about me. And that has to happen daily, a daily process. And then gains the whole world. This Christian life is different from anything else in the world because the world standards just get turned upside down when, when you're a follower of Jesus. The question is not how much I can get, it's how much I can give. It's not what is the safest thing to do, but what is the right thing to do before God. And we gain the whole world. Three things. Because so much of this is, is a call to surrender ourselves, surrender our agenda, surrender our plans to God's plan. That's, that's the nature of follow. And I want to give you three things. Surrender is a call to give up. I give up. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm yielding to God. The call to, to discipleship is a call to surrender and to surrender your very life if, if God should call for it. And sometimes, by the way, I think I'd probably be a lot better at surrendering my life in a moment than I would be surrendering my life day to day. That's the hard part. Living a life of surrender sometimes is, is, is harder than thinking. If I was called on to lay down my life for the cause of Christ in a moment, uh, that might be easier. Now, what surrender looks like so I can't, we, we, our, our default mode for all of us, always, it's a gravitational pull that we cannot escape, I think, is legalism. To say, okay, well, give me the five easy steps to uh, surrendering my life. It's different for everybody. And it's not going to be the same for you. There's, there are places where I have great resolve and strength that, that that's going to be your weak spot. And places that are my weak spot that you say, why is that hard to give up? So where do we surrender? I'm trying to answer this question. It's one of my quiet time questions. What hinders you from living the most obedient, Christ-honoring life you can live right now? What's keeping you from that? What's hindering you from that? What hinders you from your fullest service in Christ right now? And think of, think of some biblical examples. For, for the rich young ruler, Jesus said, you need to go sell all, your ha all you have and then come follow me because your stuff is so much more important than I could ever be. And it says he wouldn't want to let go of his stuff. Jesus didn't ask everybody to do that.
But that guy, that was the hitch in his plan. For Peter, it was his fishing business, I think, because he keeps going back to it. You get all the way to John, the end of the gospel of John, Jesus has been raised from the dead. Peter's gone back to fishing again. It was his security. It was his identity. Could he give up? Could he give up that? For Zacchaeus, it was his pride. For Pilate, it was his power. For the Pharisees, it was their, their legalism. For Judas, it was his own agenda for things. And for some, it's their time or their talent or their resource. And for a lot of people, the thing that keeps us from that fullest commitment is always going to be we love our sin. We love some area of sin just a whole lot more than we love Jesus. It is hard to give things up for Christ. Most of us... Uh, we just like those things that are keeping us from Jesus more than we like Jesus. And we're giving up the best that God has for us. What good will it do? This is from the message paraphrase of verse 25. What good would it do to get everything you want and lose you? The real, the real you. What good? I think about uh, professional athletes. Professional athletes are celebrities in our culture. And there's a lot of us that think, Whatever your favorite sport is, oh, just to, just to be that guy, to have that opportunity, to do what they do, to be the best at some sport, to be that famous. Uh, and you think, there are many reasons why I'm, uh, I'm not going to be playing this week in the uh, finals of the NBA. Any number of reasons they told me in high schools because I didn't play defense. I saw it as unnecessary. There are a lot of reasons why we're not the best. At, think, think of, there, are thing, there are things I like to eat. That I didn't have to have a strict diet if I was going to be a professional athlete in some area. I'd, I'd have to give some things up. There, my, my own time. Uh, oh, there's so much that has to go into being a professional athlete. To... to functioning at the highest level of a sport, there is uh, just the notoriety that you can never be just you. You're, you're always in the spotlight, and people are always watching and always, always criticizing. Then uh, there's just the thing that most of these professional athletes, their bodies are completely broken at the end of their time as a professional athlete because they function at that highest level. In order to do that, just for a short amount of time, they're willing to make these incredible sacrifices and lay down so much just to be the best for a few short years. What have you given up, surrendered for Christ? Savior and Lord. What have you surrendered for Him for something that is not just for a few years, but is eternal? Surrender is a call to take up. <laughs> I love this story. Shortly after joining the Navy, a new recruit ask his officer for a pass to attend a wedding, and the officer very graciously gave him the pass. He said, just one thing, you need to be back on base by 7 p.m. Sunday. The young man said to the officer, I mean, you don't understand. I, I am in the wedding. To which he responded, no, you don't understand. You were in the Navy. Surrender is a call to take up, to, to focus. A.W. Tozer says that people who are crucified with Christ have three distinct marks. They're facing in only one direction. They can never turn back. They no longer have plans of their own. And then surrender is a call to stand up. To surrender is the call to go beyond uh, passive living. It's a call to be a difference maker. It's a call to go beyond nice, go beyond ordinary when it comes to relationship to Christ. I think surrender just says, what have I done in my life that really demonstrates sacrifice, demonstrates commitment? What? What would my Savior be proud of about my Christian life? And what does surrender look like? What does it mean to follow Jesus? Ask these questions. 
What, what does it mean to sing a song, wherever he leads, I'll go? What does it mean to sing the song we'll sing in a moment? I surrender all. What does that look like for me? What does it look like for you? It probably looks like a lot more than what it's being lived out as just now. But the one, the one who would save his life will lose it. But the one who loses his life for my sake will save it. Just know this. I, I, have, I have been slow in different areas of my life over the course of decades now of, of really following in certain areas. But every time I've taken a step of faith, every time I've stepped beyond in an act of obedience, every time I've surrendered something that I thought was precious for the sake of Christ, I have never regretted that decision. And I've always found such joy and such affirmation and, and, and so much the, the power of the Holy Spirit in my life when those times have come. You can trust God. I can trust God. He, he really does have your best in mind. And His plan is perfect. Don't be afraid to surrender. To surrender all.